Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 362, featuring part two of my interview with Dr. Cat. This part of the interview, we talk about his time at Origin, lots of great, great, great behind the scenes stories here about uh, Richard Garriott and uh, Chris Roberts and uh, Richard's uh, dad, uh, the astronaut uh, Owen. Uh, we also talk about what it was like to program the Apple II versus the Commodore 64. Lots of good stuff here about assembly language and lots of uh, technical details I know you guys will appreciate. And uh, also, uh, we talk a little bit about uh, time, or rather the lack thereof with the massive game libraries we've all built up. Anyway, lots of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Dr. Cat. So, so, Dr. Cat, you're making it sound so easy. You, know, you just made this graphics routine and all this. I mean, how'd you learn to do all this stuff? Well, let me mention one other thing before we move on from Karen's a Fry Talk, too. I also did the sound and music for the game because, again, one guy did everything back then. My graphics package, which I very unimaginatively named Cat Graphics, uh, also had um, a sound effects routine and a sound editor. And it was able to play two sounds at once on the Apple speaker and combine them. And you could tweak little parameters in the sound editor to make interesting sound effects, which is how I made them all for the game. The only music in it is when you would die, it would play with just one note at a time, you know, just a handful of notes of taps. Da, 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 da. That, that was the music. And I just arranged it by ear. But on my sound routine... Uh, just had an 8-bit number to give the pitch of the sound. And I was just by trial and error, change the third note, sounds right, change the fourth note, that's wrong, higher, lower, okay, now that's right. But there was one note in there that was off-key. And I tried two numbers that were one apart. One of them was too high and one of them was too low. I was baffled. Why can't I get this to sound? And I'm like, well, what are the chances that your 256 numbers are all going to match notes on a musical scale perfectly? The number I wanted really was in between, and you can't do like a half or a third. What I needed was 16-bit precision on my, my frequency counter instead of 8-bit precision. But that didn't occur to me. On the 6502, you know, you only had 8-bit numbers. If you wanted a 16-bit number, you had to take two numbers and combine them together. It's like, oh, I want to add them. Well, add the low half of each one. You know, have the carry bit set, add the high half of each one and store the high half of it. It's a lot of work, you know, and you didn't do it unless you really needed it. I needed to there and I didn't know. Now I know how I could fix the music in Cameron's. Oh, and when you won the game, I had a fireworks effect. And I very cleverly worked out a scheme to do the math to make the pixels move. You know, some of them were going in straight lines, some of them are diagonal at different angles, but the distance moved per second was the same for all of them. So it would seem like they're spreading out earlier. And every once in a while in the fireworks main loop, I would just say, click the Apple speaker. I thought, oh, this will kind of sound like a staticky, bursty fireworks sound. And it kind of did. And so, yeah, there were there were fireworks when you when you want. Yeah, that's uh, one of the great things that at Origin, you know, everybody had the same attitude at Penguin. You know, we're all doing new stuff all the time. And sometimes a new computer comes out or you want to do a new thing, make the graphics better, squeeze more into your 64K. How do you do it? You just say, well, I know what I want to do. Let me think of a way I might be able to do it, experiment, try it, you know, and, and just work out how to do it. It was a very can-do kind of environment. Um, at Origin, we actually um, uh, worked around some, uh, there were, one or two bugs in the ROM of the Commodore 64 most people wouldn't know about. Uh, with the help of some guys at Origin, we found those. Uh, we hooked an oscilloscope up to the guts of the machine, and uh, we're drawing theoretical system bus timing diagrams on the whiteboard. One of our guys, Ken Arnold, had worked at Motorola. You know, he had a lot of hard... But I knew stuff about how the hardware computers worked. And we worked out the problem with the DMA and patched around the bug in the ROM and put a feature in the game no other game ever had, as far as I'm aware. But, uh, yeah, um, I mean, it helps to be bright. It helps to be obsessed with games and computers. Um, you don't have to be like that now, like you did in the 80s when we did games in assembly language because if you did games in a higher level language, they would generally be too slow. Cameron's of Freitag was a basic assembly language hybrid. Uh, Wizardry and Galactic Attack were in Pascal, Apple Pascal, which was unusual, but Wizardry wasn't a real time game. You know, it played well enough in Pascal, but most, yeah, most games you had to be an assembly language programmer, which is 
just about the hardest type of programming you can do. You know, almost nobody does it today and they shouldn't get get unity. You know, just let unity do the work for you. They've yeah. already built a game engine and graphics routines and you don't have to reinvent those wheels. But back in the 80s, we did. And we enjoyed it. You know, it was, a, it was an intellectual challenge. Programming is is like, uh, oh, I don't have to buy a book of puzzles. My my work I'm doing generates puzzles for me to solve just automatically as I work and, and they're fun. And then I go on to the next puzzle I made for myself. Yeah, I think you're the first person I've ever had on the show that's mentioned an oscilloscope. Yeah. <laughs> no, only I mean, it's uh, such different times. You know, I guess now if you have a puzzle, you go to a forum or something or read it. There's yeah. textbooks, basically. You can learn all this stuff. But you're, you know, working with an oscilloscope. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, credit to Ken. I don't yeah. know how to run an oscilloscope well enough to do digital logic analysis. You know, we had oscilloscopes in, in high school. We were using it in a much cruder way, and I don't even remember that very well. You know, I'm, I'm glad Ken was there. But this is the guy that did curses? What's that? Curses. Curses? A little curses yeah. routine for the road graphics. Yeah, the uh, the Unix. Um, Unix. Yeah, Unix cursor addressing library. Yeah, the problem with doing a game like Rogue on Unix is, well, uh, it's not like, oh, does this person have an Apple or an Atari or a Commodore? Or do they have a Nintendo or a Sega console, you know, PC or Mac, you know, or Amiga ST? No, the problem for Rogue was hooked up to their mini computer or mainframe. Do they have an ADM 3A terminal or a VT100 terminal or a deck, you know, VT52 or, you know, Lear Siegler? What, what, what terminal do they have? So someone, I think it was actually Ken Arnold or, or one of the guys who wrote Rogue also made curses, which made Rogue possible. It just said, okay. You know, when when they log on, you know, they're going to have something that configures what type of terminal they have. And curses was a library. You could say, move the text cursor to, you know, row 12, column seven. And the library would just say, oh, on the terminal they are, that's, you know, escape semicolon, you know, shift R, you know, we'll, we'll move the cursor where you want it. And it would, would let you access like, you know, if the cur terminal had special things like bold characters or inverse or flashing characters it would let you do those too so yeah that let them make rogue cross-platform between every video display terminal that you could you could hook up to the to the mainframe <laughs> so um yeah i discovered unix in 1981 uh didn't get to use it for my you know professional work until the 90s but um i was very happy to that's what my fricadia server is on when they made the Mac OS essentially Unix with the Mac, you know, interface on top of it, that makes me happy. I still get on my MacBook and sometimes just pull up a command prompt and type commands rather than using mice and icons to manipulate files and, and do things I need to do. Because it's, if you know it well, it's very efficient and, and I like it. But yeah, it's definitely old school. Yeah, that's the way we like to do things here at Matt Shep. Now, uh, right around the time, uh, when when was the time uh, that you joined uh, Origin? How, how did that come about? So that happened twice. Uh, I can tell you both stories. Um, in 1983, before I even went to join Penguin Software for a year, uh, I had worked six weeks at AngelSoft. Was you know my my employee career you know <laughs> anywhere. I've done both employee and freelance many times over the years as well as starting my own company, which uh, I put off as long as I could because I figured it would be a pain in the butt running a business, and it is, but uh, uh, worth doing for, for what I had to do. So in 83, um, they started Origin. After Ultima 1 and 2, they said, okay, we're going to self-publish Ultima 3, and um, one of uh, Lord British's buddies from the SCA was Steve Jackson of Steve Jackson Games. He was a duke in the SCA, you know, uh, or a baron, I forget which. Um, probably a duke, doesn't matter. So Space Gamer magazine that Steve Jackson published, uh, Richard's like, oh, you know, let me let me take out an ad in there. And it said, hey, we're Origin, we're going to be publishing our own games, Ultima 3 and whatever. And And it also said, we're looking for writers and artists and game designers. Which, you know, in the 80s, I wanted to bring in people like writers and artists. They weren't there yet. The, the art was done by programmers like me, you know. Um, so it was kind of interesting that they were asking for that because Origin didn't even try and start hiring artists till like three or four years later. 
Uh, but at least they were thinking about it, which, you know, we had something in common there. And they said, contact us. But the, the point of the ad, they didn't have a product to sell yet. And they wouldn't for, for you know, some, some months yet. Um, and they didn't really want to hire anyone yet. But they, in my view, you could ask Richard or Robert this, they just kind of want to say, hey, we exist and we're going to be cool. And it's not too much to take out an ad in this little magazine to say so. Nobody, you know, answered that ad and called that phone number except me. I was the one person who said, I, I would like to join Origin. <laughs> you know, I had bought Ultima One right when it came out. I thought it was great, you know. So I uh, played it all the way through as fast as I could. Trying to, Maybe I'll be the first one to beat Ultima One. You know, who knows, you know. But um, so I arranged to fly down there and I stayed with the Garriott family. Richard and Robert were still living with their parents, Owen the astronaut and Helen the artist. So while I looked for an apartment, I like stayed with them for a while. One night at dinner, like everybody happened to leave me and Owen. So I got to ask him what it was like being in space. He was up in Skylab and on the space shuttle. So that was fun. But yeah, um, when I finally left, you know, Robert drove me to the airport. Uh, it turned out. I had been waiting for them to give me something to do, and they had been waiting for me to just start doing something. Hmm. And uh, Robert said, as he's dropping me off at the airport, he said, you know, I tried to hint on the phone that we weren't ready for you. And I thought to myself, you know, what's what's this hinting? This is business. This isn't dating or something. You, you could just come out and say, we're not ready for you. Don't waste money on a play ticket. <laughs> but, you know, they were just starting the business. It was their first one, you know. Uh, and I got to meet Richard. I was at the um, the premiere of Ultima 3 they did at a Houston computer store. And there were like two pirates there ready to grab the first copy to try and get the first crack out, <laughs> as well as a bunch of actual fans. Who want to, uh, the, the pirates didn't even stick around for an autograph or say hi to Lord oh, British. Like, you know, yeah, if I were a pirate, I'd be like, okay, I'm going to do something this guy's going to hate. But, you know, I'll, I'll like say hi to him and get an autograph or something. No, Here's, here's the money. We're out of here. We got to start cracking right away. <laughs> but, uh, How did you know they so, were pirates? Oh, it was like, you know, I, I mean, I, I can read people better now than I could, you know, when I was when I was 19. But I could tell. I mean, it was all over there. And, and the way they were hustling, like, just give the money and get out of there. You know, why was it? They wanted to go start cracking it right away. They had a head start on other pirates who didn't have a copy yet. Um, I could tell. Um, I mean, there might have been another sign or two. I can't remember, but I, I'm sure they were pirates. Um, yeah. And then we went for uh, we went to Denny's afterwards. And at that time, their bacon cheeseburger was known as the British burger. So, <laughs> so me and Richard ordered Apropos. British burgers to celebrate the launch of Ultima 3. I have, by the way, a copy he gave me a week before the final masters, which as far as I know, was unique. There was one bug that was fixed before shipping, but my copy still has it where in Exodus's castle, where every encounter is supposed to be eight of every monster, the maximum available in an encounter. In my copy, it's one of every monster. So Exodus's castle is really easy to beat <laughs> on my special, unique copy of Ultima 3. Um, yeah, so 86 comes around, right? Uh, I worked a year at Penguin uh, with Dave Albert, uh, was the vice president there under Mark Pelzarski, the founder and president. And Dave had left to go be vice president of Origin. So um, they had Mobius um, contracted out to a company called Softmates to make a Commodore 64 version. And Softmates was not delivering early prototypes and milestones. They said, oh, no, don't worry. It's going fine. And we're still on track to have it ready to ship for Christmas. And Dave's like, I don't know if we're going to have this game for Christmas. We're going to miss some sales and some money there. So he tells Richard and Robert, um, I'm going to get Dr. Cat. He does ports really well and fast as lightning and bug free and great work. And we'll just contract him for like three months of work at a, at a modest rate uh, as a trial basis, you know, see if he works out and we want to bring him here. And if, you know, if Softmates and Dr. Cat both deliver a playable version, we'll ship the best, best one. We wasted, you know, a few thousand dollars on three months of contracting, you know, worst case. But if only one of them delivers and the other one doesn't, you know, especially if they don't and he does, hey, great, we had insurance. And, you know, both of them not delivering, how likely is that? They're like, that's only three months, you know, can he really <laughs> even do it? And, 
And we met that guy in 83. He seemed a little weird. <laughs> They're like, no, no, he's good. We should try this. It's, you know, if it doesn't work out, you know, send him home uh, from New Hampshire after three months and, you know, no big harm done. It's not too expensive. So I go out there. I kicked butt. I got a fast loader, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, open source one. We didn't have the phrase open source yet, but it was from uh, from Florida called Sizzle because he loaded in the Kung Fu combat module every time he got into a fight from disk, which, you know, Commodore disks weren't as fast as Apple disks normally. So I had to have this five times speed sizzle in there to make it even playable. And I got the game working good. And I went from the six color Apple graphics to the 16 colors of the Commodore. I chose which colors to put in where to make it look a bit better. And, and uh, Softmates totally different, didn't deliver. And they're like, Wow, he did a great job. Let's 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 keep him. You know, he's he's great. We love it. They kept me, and I I you know stayed there five years and worked on a lot more games. And uh, um, I hope we yeah. never ran into any of those soft mates guys. <laughs> no, I I don't know what became of them. But given their you know failure to to deliver reliably, the you know they they probably didn't last too long. Well, Dr. Cat, I've had a lot of other programmers on the show, and you know, one of the, especially the ones that started off on the Apple II. There's, I noticed there's a recurring theme, and I believe Lord British uh, said something similar to this that they love programming on the Apple II, but they just despised that Commodore yeah. 64. And I've never been real clear on what the big deal was. Well, you know, I think it's kind of a first girlfriend syndrome. You know, I actually started on my 8K Commodore Pad, which didn't have color, or, you know, or, or high res or anything. And the Apple was my first, you know, uh, computer good enough to make professional games. Although I did do a game, uh, a laser tank game in the 70s that was inspired uh, one year. Gen Con was at Horticultural Hall for nine years with miniatures battles and Dungeons and Dragons and all the hexagon based war games. Tenth year, it was at the Lake Geneva Playboy Resort. And here's early gamer geeks when, you know, not even computer gaming, you know, like board gaming, miniatures, D&D, when gaming was like an ultra fringe, ultra nerdy hobby. Here's these gamer nerds like, you know, walking through the same halls as Playboy bunnies. That was kind of surreal. But I, I cloned this laser tank game as best as I could on my pet. I'm like, oh, I'm back from the convention. Can't play laser tank anymore in the, in the Playboy Resort arcade. So I made my own version. This local guy in our user group put it in a collection of like 40 programs on tape, most of which were not games. He didn't offer to pay me. I didn't ask him. It was kind of my first published game, but I, I don't really count it. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so the Apple was, was fine, but my attitude was, you know, A, all computers are great anyway. You know, I, I, I like them all. But B, I don't pick what computer to make games for. The public does. The public said, oh, 20 million of us bought a Commodore 64. And I said, oh, so you're saying you want me to make games for the Commodore 64. Okay, <laughs> I'll get one. And I liked it. It had sprites. Um, it had, you know, uh, much, better, much better sound hardware than the Apple. Uh, it would handle micro switch joysticks rather than the analog joysticks of the Apple. That was a more sophisticated joystick on the Apple. But micro switches were, I think better and smoother for action games. A lot of what we did on the Apple was simulate the eight position joystick with the 64,000 position Apple joy or 65,536, you know, technically 256 X, 256 Y. We simulated the cheaper joystick with an Apple one. It does a better job if you got one that re just really is that joystick that only senses eight directions. Sometimes it was good. Sometimes the, the Apple joystick was just in the way and it ate up more CPU to read it cause was would like trade CPU for putting more chips and circuits into his computer in brilliant ways. But um, yeah, he was, he was a really interesting hardware designer. So anyway, yeah, Origin in particular was a hotbed of guys that loved the Apple II Plus to death and then the Apple IIe, IIc, whatever. Um, Chuckles, Richard's college, college roommate, Chuck Boucher, who I, I need to contact him today and get him on the stream. He's in San Francisco. We actually worked together um, what was it? Year year before last um, on a, a VR casino game. No, last year. Uh, time 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 is a blur to me. A, a VR casino game that that never ended up getting funding, but we worked on that for six months together. Um, he did Commodore and Atari ports 
of the uh, of the origin games, including the early Ultimas. And then when he stopped doing that, I started doing Commodore reports. The Commodore was a bigger market, and a lot of the origin games made more money on the Commodore. But yeah, all these guys, you know, Richard, uh, Stuart Marks, um, Gary wasn't as big a snob about the Apple, but he started on the Apple. Um, but then, you know, we got who was the second hit author at, at Origin? Chris Roberts, who came from a strong Commodore 64 background. He was in England, where the Commodore 64 was even more popular than it was here. And people loved it. And they bought games on tape because a lot of the young people in, in England couldn't afford a disk drive. You know, even though the Commodore and its drive were cheaper than the Apple. It's like, no, we, we managed to get a, a Sinclair Spectrum or a Commodore 64 and a tape player. And, and yeah, let's buy some games on tape. <laughs> But yeah, there were also, uh, Todd Porter was also an, an Apple snob, I got to say. Um, and they were snobs about the 8-bit Nintendo when that came along. I'm like, dude, this is 10 or 100 times as big a game market as home computers are. You know, uh, it's not a computer. It's like, well, hooks up to the TV and shows bitmap graphics. And much as computers are about monitors now, a monitor was a luxury that most people didn't bother with in the 80s because they weren't much better than the TV anyway. You were just losing some of the static and snow because you got a cleaner signal, but the resolution wasn't any better on a composite monitor. So most people hooked up their Apple or their Commodore to a TV. Uh, okay, um, displays bitmap graphics on a TV, check. Uh, 6502 CPU, 6502 CPU in the NES, which I learned something new about yesterday from some guy in his 20s about this... What? I got to tell Romero, who's still an Apple and a 6502 fanatic to this day. John Romero posted uh, hex codes on his Facebook of his wedding invitation for him and Brenda. And I disassembled it and worked out what it was doing and found actually a bug in his code <laughs> and corrected it. And he only put part of the text because he didn't want strangers showing up at his wedding. But I like... I put down all the letters you could find from the visible part of the listing, and I like wrote this wildly speculative, totally guaranteed to be wrong what it could be, instead of like, oh, it's in such and such date at this location, and please come. My version of it, it was like an adventure game challenge to you know solve a quest and come to his wedding, which fit the existing letters, and, and again, I just made it, but fun stuff. Um, so yeah, the, the Commodore had a slower disk drive, but the graphics and sound were superior. And, um, uh, you know, then like the ST and Amiga came out that were even better, but they didn't sell well. So to my view, the Commodore was still the market. Then the PC came and, you know, uh, by this time, Origin actually had a year or two where they had a round of products for the Apple under development and then they shipped them. And the Apple II game market had died. The Apple was too old. People had moved on to other computers and, and sales were abysmal. And Origin got in a little financial trouble and they needed to start getting some PC products out because the, the, the new PC was getting big enough. And, you know, um, you had to support the CGA card and the Hercules card. <laughs> oh, the and, Hercules and, card. <laughs> and EGA and VGA. You know, anybody who really played Ultima right and enjoyed it in beautiful 256 colors had a VGA card, Right. But some people had an older IBM graphics card. So Gary Smith, again, my buddy, he co-designed um, Ultima Runes of Virtue with me. Great guy. Tangled Tales, Crusader. Hope I can uh, contact him and get him in the Legend stream. Um, he did the drivers for all the older graphics thing. And it would, like, dither down the 256 colors to, to 16 color EGA with colors blended in a checkerboard. It actually looked surprisingly good. Uh, but he even did monochrome for the Hercules monochrome display adapter. If that's all you had, you could still play Ultima 6. And Ultima 6 saved the company uh, because they kept doing Apple games too long, you know, uh, even when there was mo no market for it because they liked it so much. It was a great tinkerer's machine. Uh, it was a very open architecture and a lot of nice stuff it could do. But again, more and more stuff it did was supplanted by newer computers from Apple and from other companies uh, throughout the 80s. And uh, yeah. Um, it's just an odd thing. And, you know, there was a great assembler for it. I met at uh, John Romero's third Apple II game programmers reunion. I was at the first one at Ion Storm and the third one at his house in Santa Cruz. I met Roger Ragnar, who wrote Merlin, which was the assembler I did all my work with. And there was a Commodore version also. Oh, yeah, yeah. I said, thank you for Merlin. It was such a godsend to me. But several of the guys at Origin, including Chuck and Richard, used Lisa 
which was a decent assembler. You could get work done. I mean, he made Ultima with Lisa. It must be, a, you know, an adequate tool, right? But the line editor wasn't as good. We didn't have screen editors back then where you could just freely move the cursor around with arrow keys or, God forbid, a mouse. Mouse came along and, you know, uh, Bill Budge made mouse paint in, like, the mid-'80s. You know, ooh, mouse, you know. But, um, yeah, it was just harder to edit text in Lisa than it was in Merlin, which was the number one reason I like Merlin better. It had other very good features. But they wrote it in Lisa because they found it first. And if somebody showed them Merlin, like, two years later, which, you know, I'm, I'm sure me or other people, you know, they, they were aware they could look at, why would I change to Merlin when I'm used to Lisa? You know, I know all the keystrokes, I know how it works, and I'm comfortable with it. And, and I think... To a large extent, you know, again, it's first girlfriend syndrome with Apple. They got an Apple, they started making games, they loved it. They just kept loving it. Um, but I've, I've worked on, you know, web games. I've done uh, slot machines for standalone cabinets that go into a casino, uh, console games. You know, I'll code for anything. And I tell people when I do job interviews or when I talk about myself, all the software and hardware and engines that could qualify as quote unquote platform you make a game for that I've been through, always my platform is the human mind. That's really what I design and implement games for. And uh, the hardware in between is a an important detail, but it's, it's still just a detail compared to how does that mind work and how do I make the game interact with that? So. <laughs> that sounds like a Bartlett's quotation to me. Yeah, no, I have, Bartlett, a, right here. I, I have a number of lines that I hope I'll be remembered for after I die. Uh, attention is the currency of the future. Um, doesn't sound like that futuristic or, or visionary now, but I started saying that in the 90s, you know. I like um, it. Yeah, again, I got a modem in 1980. I was all over what you could do with a modem. These BBSs, Genie, CompuServe, The Source, Prodigy, Quantum Link before it became America Online. Um, so, you know, I kind of saw where things are going. The advertising industry, they knew this back in like the 50s and 60s. You know, what units is advertising bought and sold in? You know, human attention. They have CPM. That's how many thousand or million, you know, people did I get an ad impression on in this newspaper, this TV ad or whatever. And I pay per person that saw the ad. So they knew already in advertising a long time before computer games. Uh, the attention is what matters. And with you know, uh, resources less and less limited. I'm not, I, I don't play however many games I can afford at 40 to $60 a pop anymore. I play however many games I have time for. And by the way, it's a, a tiny minuscule fraction of the number of free games available. I can't, I can't ever see them all. So human time and attention, it will always be a scarce resource and will be increasingly valuable as, you know, people, I mean, you know, you could you could be a pharaoh or an emperor thousands of years ago and say, oh, I shall have ice cream because I shall send slaves to run to the tallest mountain and scoop some snow and, and pack it together in a bond, bring it here before it melts and make ice cream and I can eat ice cream. You know, I can I can like spend a few bucks or get on Netflix where I already have a subscription and say, here's a fabulous entertainment called a movie. You know, thousands of people worked for two and a half years and spent $150 million to amuse me with this. The Pharaoh could have gotten a few thousand people to like put on a mock valve. He couldn't have Lord of the Rings to watch, you know, ever. <laughs> and uh, to us, it's just, ah, should I do that today? Or should I like, you know, try a new, try a new game on my iPad? You know, what, what do I feel like? You know, it's, uh, we're, we're amazing. And we can write software that changes the world. Just, you know, give you a place to sit in a computer to code it on, which is what I've been trying to do. And uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's an amazing time to be alive. And watching it transition from a time when we didn't have, it was, I would say to my dad, dad, I'm bored. And like, he's working up lecture notes for his class and has to be distracted. Well, you, you, you try go doing this. Oh, I already read that, you know. And, and now people tell me I'm bored for KDA players. I'm like, what's wrong with you? You have the internet. You know, you have more entertainment than you could ever possibly work your way through in a lifetime. And, and you're bored, you know, get, get a little more adventuresome with the search engine. Go find something to do. Um, I, don't, I don't have enough time to keep up ever. It's, it's the fire hose metaphor, you know. So, uh, but I love it. It's, uh, it's a drastic change. And, you know, mankind and life is going to change a lot more in, in the next 50 years. And uh, 
looking forward to, to seeing where it goes and maybe helping nudge it a little in one direction or another with my work. You know, I often think about that. I'm sure you're probably like uh, me and a lot of people that watch this show. We have these this almost unlimited Steam games library, including mm -hmm. lots and lots of games you've never installed. And you know what yeah. I kind of worry about is you know back in the day you save up your money, you get you know fifty sixty dollar game basically. Mm -hmm. uh, even if that game you really hated it at first, you're just going to stick with it because you're like, man, I spent this money, you know. Yeah. And then, you know sometimes those games you didn't like at first kind of grew on you and it became like your mm -hmm. favorite games. You think the kids these days, they'll never experience that, right? Because they can just quickly move yeah. on to the next game. Well, I mean, to me, it's a good thing. When I was young, you know, there was the uh, the paperback or the group of paperbacks that you never got around reading. And, you know, I got Ray Bradbury at the Griffin Bookstore, which I, I was just at their 40th anniversary, which is fabulous. They got a certificate from Congress, you know, thanking them for their service to the Indiana community. They are the longest continuously operating public game room in the United States. And this is where I learned to play D&D &D and war games and miniatures battles. So I had to go to their 40th anniversary convention. I, my work's turning 20, their work's turning 40, and, and bless them for it. Um, but yeah, Ray Bradbury pa paperbacks were like uh, a quarter when some of the other science fiction and fantasy ones were 50 cents or a dollar. So I got all the Bradbury's. But yeah, uh, you know, I went from the books you didn't get around to reading, which I still have some of on the shelves behind me um, to this day, to the board games you never got around to playing. And now Steam is the new version. And again, <laughs> you know, oh, I put this on my watch list. It was 10 bucks. I might have eventually bought it at 10 bucks. But look, it's 250 this weekend. Boom. It's it's practically free. You know, that's that's pocket change these days. So, yeah, I have a bunch of Steam games I haven't tried. One of the reasons I want to get rich is so I can like sit down for a few months and just like play and read stuff. Is like, no, no, send everyone away who has work they want to pay me to go away. I'm 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 reading rereading some of my old comic. No, I'll read new comic books I didn't read or get me some of the '60s comics I never got to read. Lee and Kirby, great stuff. I I, I grew up inspired by them too. Uh, and I'm I'm playing all my Steam games. And I'm reading 10 books I want to read and movies I want to watch, TV shows I want to binge watch on Netflix, you know. Uh, six months six months with no work, I won't even come close to catching up. But at least I'll feel good about, wow, I really wasted a lot of time and enjoyed myself. And, you this know, is why we need a TARDIS. I mean, I don't even need to travel in time. You know, Just give me that yeah. time freeze functionality so we can catch up on everything. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I've, I've never revealed this to anyone, but... Um, my my one wish I know for sure if I get three well I have two one is is for like um, uh, uh, somebody special to me who who has a lot of health problems to like have perfect health forever for the rest of their lives um, but for me uh, it's like um, a castle in in this this alternate reality it's it's a gaming world I'm involved in where when I'm, I have a magic ring that teleports me there instantly, anytime, and while I'm there, zero time passes in this world. So I could go there, spend like 99% of my time goofing off and having fun, 1% of my time, oh, I got a deadline to do this amazingly complicated computer game. Oh, well, I'll goof off in this alternate world for 20 years, and 1% of my time, I'll like pop back in the real world the next day, and people are like, wow, it's done already, I'm like, yeah, I can make I can make five <laughs> games a day and make all the money I need in the real world. I don't have to bring gold back from my other world. I'll just bring some software over and sell it, and you know, yeah, that's that's my wish. But the the unlimited time aspect of it would, you know, I I think everybody would like that. You know, nobody wants to have mortality, but uh, um, you know, maybe after a few thousand years you'd want to die. We really don't know. <laughs> after after fifty or a hundred, most people still want to live. Um, so. <laughs> And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I uh, should be back next week with the uh, third installment of this interview. Lots of great stuff coming up, so stay tuned. I know you will uh, like it. Uh, as always, I want to thank you very, 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 very much for your support of this show. Uh, it really means a lot to me, guys. I just can't uh, express that enough, how grateful I am that uh, people like yourself are willing to stop up and support the show. Uh, financially, you know, all I ask is a buck a show. That's one dollar per episode to sign up at the Patreon site. I also get some cool uh, perks that way. I also appreciate uh, you're telling people about the show 
uh, helping me uh, line up guests, uh, sending me news items, all of that stuff. I really appreciate it, guys. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. All right. What about that news from the Matt Cave? Yeah, the old printer's out, so I'm having to uh, look at the phone here, but I guess this will work. All right, a couple items from good old Stig. Uh, first one, he wrote in about this first look trailer video for the full throttle remastered project that is on the PlayStation 4, the PS4. Uh, the remastered edition features all new hand-drawn art, 3D high-resolution artwork, remastered audio and music, and a commentary track. It uh, looks pretty uh, fantastic. I don't happen to have a PS4. Probably not going to buy one for this, uh, so I'm not sure what's going on uh, with the other platforms, but uh, it seems like they're focused on the PS4 for now, anyway. Uh, he also, this is probably a little bit more uh, interesting for uh, you guys. Uh, there is a uh, game called The Last Ninja, actually a series of games you might remember from the uh, Commodore era. Anyway, they're celebrating their 30th anniversary, and to celebrate that, uh, System 3 is releasing a remake to the Last Ninja series featuring uh, Last Ninja 1, 2, and 3. Uh, the games will have additional locations, puzzles, and an updated fighting system. It will keep its isometric view, but allow the levels to be created in 3D uh, to allow the player to zoom in. Uh, Last Ninja will be available on Kickstarter starting on February the 3rd. Uh, and a lot of the original uh, team is working on this, so pretty exciting uh, stuff. Uh, I have to admit, I'm not real familiar with the series myself, but uh, I hear about it all the time, and I do hear the uh, uh, the music from it on my uh, remix stations all the time, so that's cool. Uh, so anyway, I'll try to keep you posted on that. Uh, and then finally, uh, a job announcement. Uh, good friend, a friend of the show, uh, Game Banshee, apparently they are running short of editors these days, so uh, I assume if you like this show, you probably would be, uh, they'd probably be interested in talking to you. Uh, since you like RPGs so much, it is an RPG site. Uh, they are looking for people with some experience, at least five years experience with the PC, console, tabletop role-playing games. I'm going to assume most of you guys have that. A uh, strong knowledge of the English language uh, with prior writing experience and at least three to four hours of free time each week to write news and other articles. Uh, so it's not like a pretty good opportunity if you want to pick up a little extra uh, pocket money there and write about uh, games, maybe make a little money from your hobby is always a good thing. So I thought I would uh, mention that. All right, I think that'll do it for the news. What about that ale of the week? Uh, well, this week I, I'm going to start uh, this little series, little mini series. Hopefully, it's uh, I can find the rest of these. But they got this Mortal Kombat 10 series of ales, uh, and this one here is the Sub Zero Imperial IPA. Uh, so I thought this is kind of neat, a video game uh, themed ale selection. You know, how could you resist that? Plus, uh, Mortal Kombat's always been one of my uh, favorite fighting games. Uh, let's see, Pale Ale, uh, All About the Malt. I wanted to see if they had more of a theme going here with the uh, Sub-Zero. Uh, not sure. Drink Icy for more hops, <laughs> warmer for more malt. Uh, well, that's helpful. Uh, let's see, pretty cool bottle artwork. Alcohol by volume, 8.5%. So, uh, definitely a bit on the stronger side. Not crazy, but definitely not something you'd want to drink on an empty stomach or quickly or anything uh, uh, silly like that. Uh, so anyway, let's get this uh, Sub-Zero Imperial IPA... I <laughs> can't talk. Uh, let's get this Sub-Zero Imperial IPA open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Mortal Kombat 10 Sub-Zero Imperial IPA here in the rather excellent drinking horn. It's really liking the uh, the bottle art on that. Looks great. Smells really good, too. I can even smell it from back here. It's very hoppy. <sighs> nice uh, a citrusy aroma on this. Uh, just smells really, really good. Uh, with some of these, I just don't know how you could smell this and not want to instantly drink it. Uh, I will not resist that temptation. Ah, 
a really crisp uh, flavor on this one. It's definitely very, very hoppy. Uh, a little more hoppy than bitter, I would say. Uh, goes down pretty smooth, but there's a lot of flavor going on. Actually, uh, pretty impressed with this one. <laughs> Already good aftertaste on it too. Kind of a uh, nice malt uh, flavor to that. Let me try it again. I mean, this one's just really excellent. A really nice finish on this. It's uh, smooth. It's kind of all the things I like about a, a good ale. A lot of flavor. It's complex. There's lots of different stuff uh, going on there, so it keeps it interesting. It's uh, uh, hoppy, but not. they don't get carried away with the hoppiness or the bitterness. Uh, it's got 8.5% alcohol, but I don't really taste that alcohol. Uh, so it's not like a really, uh, you know, fumes coming out of this or anything. Uh, actually, this is a really superb uh, IPA. I'm really uh, pleased with this. You know, you'd think they <laughs> spent all their money on the licensing uh, for the Mortal Kombat characters, and they kind of have a cheesy ale to go with it. But uh, actually, this is really, really good. Uh, India Pale Ale. I'll try it one more time here. Yeah, just a really, really nice uh, selection on this one. I'm just uh, really impressed with this. Uh, if you want to, <laughs> if you like India Pale Ale, uh, I think you'd really like this. It's uh, Imperial India. It's Imperial, so it'd be a little bit stronger than your typical India Pale Ale. But again, they didn't go crazy with it. 8.5% uh, is not not too bad. Uh, I think this is really delicious. I, I would highly uh, recommend this. I'm gonna go a full five out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, Mortal Kombat 10 Sub Zero Imperial IPA. You know, I don't. I haven't really played the game all that much, but uh, they definitely did their uh, did some good stuff with this uh, this IPA here. So see if you can find it. I think you'll be impressed. All right, let's wrap this up with a quotation. So let's wrap this up with a quotation. And uh, Dr. Cat had mentioned Ray Bradbury, uh, who's an author I really like. I actually got to hear him speak one time. Uh, but anyway, I thought this was an interesting quote. It goes something like this. Don't think. Thinking is the enemy of creativity. It's self-conscious, and anything self-conscious is lousy. You can't try to do things. You simply must do things. <laughs> so mull that over, and see you guys next week. Camelot! Camelot! It's only a model.